All right, so let's talk about the fertility workup. Okay, so let's say we have this patient who's 35. Uh, let's say she's been pregnant three times, has three kids in a new relationship, we'll say. Trying to get pregnant for six months. So at six months, this patient has about a 70, after six months, 75% of patients should have conceived. So given that she's 35, it's time to initiate the infertility workup to make sure we're not missing something. So the infertility workup is pretty straightforward. So I always draw this to help organize the conversation so that we know what parts we're checking and why we're checking them. So you have brain, uterus, tubes, ovaries, and sperm. So 40% of couples will have a problem with the ovary. Uh, either they don't have, they skip periods, they require medication to bring on a period. Um, so you can usually deduce whether they have some ovulation dysfunction by asking them about their period history. So let's say this patient has regular periods. So she has regular periods, so she, you know she has, right, she ovulates. So um, the only thing I would check there is a TSH to make sure her thyroid is functioning properly. I would not check a prolactin level because she has regular periods. And the other thing that goes with the ovary is age. We know that as the age of the woman increases, the number of eggs that one has available and the quality of those eggs declines, okay? So what we're gonna do is we wanna check markers of ovarian reserve. So markers of ovarian reserve are typically an AMH, an FSH, estradiol, and an ultrasound where we count the number of follicles. Uh, and that's called the antral follicle count. So the AMH and the, and the ultrasound antral follicle count, these tend to be concordant and they are good markers of ovarian quantity, not quality, but quantity. They're really good at telling you how many eggs you might have available at a given, in, in, in time. AMH is a, a glycoprotein hormone that comes from the granulosa cells here in each primordial follicle. The higher this number, the more oocytes you have available for recruitment. Again, this test is a screening test. It is not good at predicting quality. It is really good at predicting how responsive the ovary is to fertility treatment. But that does not predict who can and cannot get pregnant. So again, this is not diagnostic of anything. It is just a screening tool that helps us counsel patients on how aggressive to be with fertility treatment. The ultrasound antral follicle count is a visual representation of the AMH, if you will, uh, putting it kind of simply. Uh, it's where we look at the ovary and we literally count how many follicles there are. And if there are, the more follicles there are, again, the more responsive the ovary is. So you can see why these two tests tend to be concordant. The FSH estradiol is a test that tells us how efficient the brain is communicating with the ovary. Um, as the, the brain sends a hormone called FSH to recruit eggs here in the ovaries, um, ultimately one will be released that will make a lot of estrogen before it's released um, and that estrogen level will feed back to the brain, cut the signal off, send another signal called LH and that's how uh, ovulation uh, occurs. The FSH level, um, if we like it to be less than 15, ideally you want it to be less than 10. If it is high, that means the brain is working really hard to communicate with the ovary and the, the systems in place um, that keep the brain at bay are not present. So usually as the age of the woman increases, this communication between the brain and the ovary doesn't work as well. Um, so that's why the FSH level starts to rise and the, uh, the, the um, brain starts to work harder. Questions or comments about the ovary? You can ask, it's okay. All right, so after, Go ahead. I was just gonna emphasize to Priscilla just where you draw the FSH and E2 matter. So with your phase, FSH E2 is what. Yeah, so that's a great point. So you typically wanna draw these between cycle day two and five. Um, people talk about a day three, because that's when it was normally done. But day two through five is when you wanna get the FSH estradiol. And you need to get the estradiol because you can't interpret an FSH by itself. You need the estrogen level, okay? All right, so this patient's AMH comes back at two, which is a good level. We like it to be above one and a half, ideally two or greater suggests a great response. 
So her level is two, her antral follicle count is 25. We like it to be above 10. Uh, so she's doing good there. And then her FSH is nine and her estradiol is 36. So these all kind of check out as suggesting she's someone who's got a good ovarian reserve and she should respond well to fertility treatment. The next step is the sperm. 50% of couples will have a male factor. So a semen analysis is critical. So a semen analysis is a simple test we ask the guy to abstain from ejaculation for two to five days before we look uh, at the semen parameters. And the semen parameters that we look at are volume, count, motility, and there are two types, total and progressive. And then we look at uh, morphology. We currently use the WHO fifth edition standard, which is from 2010. Um, and those reference ranges are set uh, so that we like the volume of the ejaculate to be more than 1.5 mils. If it's less than 1.5 mils, that suggests there might be an obstruction somewhere. We want the concentration or count to be greater than 15 million. We like the total motility to be about 40%, the progressive motility to be about 32%, and the morphology, we want at least 4% of the sperm to be normal. Everyone gets fixated on count, but motility is just as important. So if you have a good count, but you have very poor moving sperm, that's a problem. It's important to note that these reference ranges are actually the fifth percentile. So what the WHO did is they looked at 2,000 men between 1999 and 2010. And there were some studies where, that they did where there were two separate studies that totaled 2,000 men. And they basically looked at um, uh, the semen parameters of men who contributed to a pregnancy in the prior year. And what they found, and then they broke out the parameters into fifth percentiles, all the way down to the fifth percentile and below. So these cutoffs represent the fifth percentile. So if you're under the fifth percentile, you're in a group of men that put another way is, uh, of, uh, out of 2,000 men who contributed to a pregnancy in a prior year, less than, you know, less than 5% of them had parameters in these uh, that were lower than this. So a semen analysis is really good at telling you if there is a problem. It's not really good at telling you that you're okay. So just because you have 20 million and a motility above 40%, does that mean you're okay? Probably, but we don't really know. It's not very good at telling you you're fine. Um, there was a nice study done in 2001 that showed that uh, concentration over 40 million was probably suggestive of fertility. Um, but again, that's all just to highlight that this test is basically 80 years old, 75 years old, um, and it's still the best test we have for getting a gross sense of what the male fertility potential is, and it has significant limitations. Again, it's good at telling you when there's a problem. It's not very good at telling you that you're okay. Questions or comments about semen testing? Would this be the first step before you get the maternal hormones? Now, it's usually all done together. Okay. So I, I would, that's a good question. I would always get everything <clears throat> uh, in tandem, in parallel. The next, question, the next thing that we look at is the HSG to make sure the tubes are open. The HSG is a pelvic exam um, done under an x-ray machine. It's crampy, it's uncomfortable, it is not fun. I tell guys it's the same thing as getting kicked in the genitals, that cramping pain that guys feel is probably the same pain that uh, women feel when they have periods, really bad periods, and when they get this study. So this study is a test that can tell you about the uterine cavity. If there's a filling defect, it'll tell you about it. It, it is not diagnostic, though, of, 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 of uh, uterine anomaly, but it can give you a clue if there's a problem. Um, but otherwise, it's really good at telling you if the tubes are open. So you push dye. The radiologist pushes dye that inflates the uterine cavity and that's what causes the cramping. And then that, they take pictures of the uterine cavity and then they see if the dye spills out the tubes or not. Questions or comments about the HSG? So those are the pieces of the infertility workup. Um, pretty straightforward. Those are the things that we do. So in this patient, let's say her tubes are open, the sperm is 
maybe got a little bit low parameters. Um, so the question is, what do we do next? Well, if the tubes are open, um, we can start treatment with uh, clomiphene, 100 milligrams, and artificial insemination. Again, remember this patient has a regular period, so I don't need to give her letrozole because she doesn't have PCOS, so I would start with clomiphene to help her super ovulate. Um, because that drug tricks the brain into thinking there's no um, um, estrogen around, sometimes the patient will have some mood swings, some mood irritability, some hot flashes, so that is something to caution patients about with the use of clomiphene citrate. You take the medication for five days and then um, start using an ovulation prediction kit on cycle day 10. So what that looks like is this. So here's cycle day one, cycle day three through seven. She takes Clomid, 100 milligrams. Cycle day 10, she starts using the ovulation prediction kit. And then if she has 28 day cycles, somewhere between 12 and cycle day 12 and 14, it's gonna be positive. That means she's gonna ovulate in the next 36 to 48 hours. So we'll do an artificial insemination where we put the sperm directly into the uterine cavity um, within that time frame. So this is usually, if this is a Wednesday that she has the positive, then the IUI is on Thursday. And then two weeks after this, she's either pregnant or she's not. If she's not pregnant, we start over again. And you do this for three cycles. Likelihood of success is about five to 10%. And that's per cycle with a five to 8% twin rate. And the cost out of pocket is about $500 for the IUI, $4 for the Clomid. And then if we need to do any mid-cycle ultrasounds, it can be about $300, um, it's variable, plus a trigger shot. That's assuming they have no insurance coverage. If they have insurance coverage, obviously these things are different. And then if they're not pregnant up to that point, then we move on to IVF. Questions? No, this is unlikely to come back, but I think it's interesting, like the subtle ovulation defects that we can treat with like homemade and things like that, just to like emphasize to uh, Priscilla that people who fall out of that like 25 to 35 day cycle range, they can still, there's still room for improvement and we're not exactly sure what's going on, but it could be that we're correcting maybe like a luteal phase defect or just timing and the sinking of molecules to a receptive endometrium. Yeah, so I think in patients who have any, so even patients who have regular periods, you just super ovulating them may improve uh, their outcome just by getting them to release multiple eggs. If they release multiple eggs, they'll make multiple corpora lutea, which will make a lot of progesterone. Um, so um, usually we treat people empirically in the infertility world um, because many times you don't find a cause for their infertility. So I'll stop there.